please welcome to the stage Carol Charnow, AAM board member, co-chair of the AAM Local Host Committee, and president and CEO of Boston Children's Museum. Ah, <laughs> oh, I have some fans. Um, Welcome, everyone, to our final day together in Boston. It certainly went fast. The AAM Board of Directors, the AAM staff, and the Boston Local Host Committee sincerely hope that this conference and expo have filled you with inspiration and learning. I know it has for me. Let's give a shout out also to Tim Ritchie and the hosts of last night's wonderful party at the Museum of Science. <laughs> I want to also give a round of applause and an expression of heartfelt thanks to the incredible volunteers, local hosts, speakers, sponsors, vendors, and exhibitors, as well as the staff of the Boston Convention Center and our host hotels. I want to give a personal thanks to Laura Lott and the AAM staff, and I do want to say their names the people that I have worked closely with, Eileen, Jennifer, Brooke, Caitlin, Dean, and Aisha. They have been absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I'm just gonna go off script for a moment to just say a personal thanks to Laura and her leadership for helping to save our sector. Um, as a CEO um, and all of you who have working in museums across the country, we know how hard this has been. And that funding from the government and all Laura's encouragement and support over the last two years has really sustained us. It is remarkable how we are surviving and we're going to thrive. So thank you, Laura, for your tremendous leadership. And I couldn't stop my thank yous without thanking my personal co-host, Charlene Morrell-Smith, and the wonderful staff of Boston Children's Museum who've really supported this conference and allowed me to spend a lot of time with AAM. And to thank all of you for coming all this way to Boston and making this convening a meaningful and memorable experience. So thank you so much for being here. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our final keynote speaker, Sandra Jackson Dumont, Director and Chief Executive Officer of the new Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. She oversees all curatorial, educational, public, and operational affairs for the museum, including realization of an 11-acre campus in Los Angeles currently under construction. I can't wait to visit it when it opens next year. Sandra comes to the Lucas Museum from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. She'll be joined in discussion by two other distinguished museum colleagues, Ben Garcia, Executive Director of the American LGBTQ Plus Museum, and Mika G. Conway, Chief Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Officer and EEO Director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Certainly, none of us can argue that the global pandemic has dramatically altered our workforces, our workplaces, and our work cultures. And as we begin to emerge from its shadow, and I certainly hope we do, our return to work planning and workplace strategies will be characterized what psychologists call stress-related growth that advances the flourishing of all our workplaces. The study of SRG started in the 1990s and describes the potential positive results of traumatic stress, including resilience, coping skills, and closeness to others. That's really good to hear because we've seen a tremendous amount of stress and trauma from both the pandemic and the racial reckoning of the past two years in our workplaces. Today's conversation offers a reimagining of our museum procedures, practices, and policies to ensure a safe, equitable, and more generous work environment. And as we depart the meeting today and return to work tomorrow, let us reaffirm in words and deeds that our greatest institutional asset are those who we work with and employ each day 
who strive to deliver the best public service. Please welcome to the stage Sandra Jackson Dumont to lead today's conversation. Thank you. Hello, thank you. All right. I feel like Steve Jobs. Maybe not, okay. Hi. Oh. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Okay. Um, I want to thank Laura Lott and her, for her kind invitation um, and her incredible team, Dean, Caitlin, and Caitlin for their support in organizing this gathering. Um, I am also grateful to speak on this land today. It is the unceded territory of the Massachusetts, the Pawtucket, and their neighbors, the Wapanog and the Nipuk, sorry, Nipmuc peoples who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. Please join me in paying respect to their elders and the people who are the custodians of this space, past and present. Okay. Can everyone stand up for a second? So, um, I hear you guys have been doing some deep thinking this week. No? <laughs> no one's been doing it? Okay. All right, we have some work to do then. Um, sounds like you guys have been doing some great thinking and really happy to be gathered again together. And so one of the things that um, I like to do, and um, my team um, who are amazing in the back, raise your hand, woohoo, Lucas Museum. Um, they um, are probably annoyed and tired of hearing this song, but I can never tire of this song. And this is an incredible song by none other than Donny Hathaway. I'm not gonna sing it but we're gonna dance to it real quick. It's called Love, Love, Love. And if you just listen to the words, I feel like we can apply these words to our institutional spaces. And so we're gonna just take maybe one and a half minutes or so, and then we'll get into it. But for now, can you guys play this song? And you can turn it up really loud. It's a conference, but it's okay. We can pretend like it's a club for a second. So I'm gonna come down. All right. I see one museum director up here who can move. New Jersey in the house. All right. Are people going to dance, really? No? Love, love, love. Why did you take so long Why did you take so long to come to me? Oh, baby. Oh, baby. And love, 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 your love. Tell me where you hide. Where you hiding all from me? The time. Each time I tried to find someone to take a place, it was all in vain. No, that lips were never quite the same. No, baby. I don't generally when dance. I, was I, <laughs> I dance all the time, but not on stage. Deep inside, I was missing you. Deep inside, I was missing you. You make me fall in love with you. I don't know just what I'm gonna do. Oh, honey, Did I hear these words? I looked out into empty space. And all I saw was your sweet face. Okay. Thank you so much. I looked out into empty space and all I saw was your sweet face. Don't you want people to see your institutions that way? Don't we want as individuals to be seen that way? Hey, Kelly. Um, amazing, amazing, amazing. And so you guys have been working hard all week. I know there's like the intro Steve Jobs music, but then there's like that, just very soulful reach deep into your spirit, music that makes you feel like, wow, how, how, why has it been so long since I connected to you, right? So the title of this keynote panel is Speak the Truth and Point to Hope. It's a phrase that I often use when talking about how we can say the thing that needs to be said and still be hopeful. 
When uncomfortable truths need to be shared, I often, but not always, but often, find people to be unwilling, afraid, or not brave enough, or not skilled enough to have the truthful conversation. I've had the good fortune to be joined, I am gonna be joined by two amazing colleagues, um, Ben Garcia, who is the executive director of the American LGBTQ Plus Museum. Okay, he'll be out in just one second and you can clap again. Um, and Mika G. Conway, who's the Chief Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Officer and EE, EEO Director at the National Gallery of Art. Woohoo! <laughs> so today we aim to speak and have a truly candid conversation about the practices, policies, and strategies that museums are implementing to foster organizational cultures in which we can thrive. We all can thrive. In essence, we will discuss how we can reframe museums for the present. By present, I mean now. Now being active and nuanced. Recognizing that there is always a now. In other words, now is today, yesterday, and tomorrow. We will discuss the ways in which we can be dynamic, evolving, and engaged institutions, present in the world and of the world a world that is at once of our time and nonetheless moored in histories and therefore context. It is no secret that we are living in extraordinary times when hierarchies of all kinds are being challenged inside and outside of museums. The mere fact that we are gathered here together to consider how to speak the truth and point to, point to hope suggests that broad awareness is suggest a broad awareness that we're not simply going through a moment, but rather we are experiencing an ethical, social, and cultural seismic shift in our work and our practice. The world is moving, so the question is, how will our institutions and our skill sets move with it? I don't pretend to have a one-size-fits-all answer. I'm very skeptical of those kinds of folks. What we can do is take you into our practices, thinking, and experiences, our processes of thought that might be relevant to the work that you're doing, because the questions that we are grappling with as a group of three individuals are most likely very familiar or similar to the questions facing your institution and the people who make up the place where you work. At the Lucas Museum, we are highly aware of being a part of a long trajectory of institutions that have changed the nature of art museums. I could mention the Victoria and Albert Museum, which set the model for exploring creativity across the borders of art and design. There's MoMA, which established a model for museums dedicated to the art of our time in all disciplines. There's the Whitney, which was established on a national basis to champion American art and American artists. There's the International Center for Photography, which was founded to collect, document, and teach about a single artistic medium. There's the Studio Museum in Harlem, a, an institution dedicated to black art and artists, which was founded a half century ago as a part of the extraordinary wave of culturally specific institutions. In each of these cases, spaces needed to be carved out, perceptions needed to be expanded, and the canon of art history needed to be reshaped, reordered, or just retooled in order to use language that actually was present in that moment. Narratives, of which we are completely invested in at the Lucas Museum, are the stories we live with. For that reason, we believe that the perspective that people bring to artwork informs the meaning and significance of the narratives they convey. They inform how we view and understand the world, giving shape and character to real events, imagined realities, systems of power even. Narrative art gives visual form to specific stories, and the meanings they contain. The same is true for our everyday existence in the workplace. It has contours and shapes. And so today, amidst what we like to believe is the tail end of a global pandemic, we are radically addressing this. And so our, all, our work lives have been altered and our work culture has pushed us to raise new questions and possibilities for creating more equitable and inclusive spaces. 
We're here to have a candid conversation, so I'm not going to introduce them and all of their accolades and all the things that they do, but we're going to spend time coming up on stage and having the conversation so that we're going to have a discussion about how we create thriving cultures in our workplaces. What does it mean to truly invade the intellectual oppression and white supremacist behaviors and practices and realities that buoy humanity and structural freedom? What can we do to foster that? What skills and competencies are required to engender this? It does not happen by osmosis. It does not happen by one training. It does not happen because someone says so, but it happens because we do so. Today, we are going to talk about that which gnaws at us and makes us feel a sense of urgency. That which prods us to speak the truth and point to hope. So please join me in welcoming my colleagues and co-conspirers in this conversation, Ben and Mika. They also like a fly, the shoes, check the sneakers. Come on up. Thank you. Oh, I'm really, really Mike. Hi. You're amazing. How about that? <laughs> OK. So we had an amazing conversation um, and, uh, on the phone, and we tried to not talk ourselves out of this. Um, so meaning not talk ourselves out of coming here, but talk talk ourselves to the point where it doesn't feel interesting and compelling with you all participating. So today, um, the first question we should talk about is this conversation we had about trust and museums. Mika, you brought up this notion of trust and the need for trust. Um, and, uh, and I'll just start by saying when she said, you know, um, I think museums, we need to be able to trust them. And she talked about this need for that and I said, well, I think trust requires um, safety. And I said, it's, it's interesting, I generally don't believe in safe spaces. I believe in safer spaces. I haven't found a place where I felt completely safe yet. And, um, and so Mika um, and Ben and I had this awesome conversation. And so maybe we can let people into that discussion. Well, um, you know, I, I came to the National Gallery in September of 2020, so I onboarded during the pandemic, and it's a place where I still, ha there's still a lot of my colleagues of, you know, we're close to a thousand staff, I think, at the National Gallery, and there's a lot of folks that I still have not yet met in person. Um, you know, we, ha we haven't had everyone all back on site, um, but I've been, I've met a lot of people on Zoom, I've met many people in person, and in the conversations that we're having and some of the challenges that, that we face as an organization as we try to change you know, one of the things that I think um, we're in, is in short supply is, is, is trust. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of lack of trust. And, and like Sandra said, uh, we, need to, we need to make those spaces safer, but it's hard to figure out how to do that when you don't know people, you know, and it's, and it's so foundational. Um, and it's also tied in with this larger notion of museums themselves as being trustworthy. And I think at various times uh, during this conference, people have cited the fact that museums you know, rank very high on this trust scale. Yeah. And I think sort of questioning why, why that is and what museums need to do and how they need to change to stay trustworthy mm -hmm. is, is a big part of what we're, what we're looking at, especially in jobs like mine. Yeah, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I think what you were saying before, Sandra, about I think workplaces aren't safe for lots of people um, who come into them and uh, if you're black or brown, if you are queer, if you are uh, coming from a background that doesn't have generational wealth, there's all kinds of ways, you know, if, if you are identify as a woman or you're on the gender, you know, and you're gender non-conforming or transgender. Um, and so I think, you know, for those of us who work in spaces and want to find trust, it's with people, right? Not with organizations. So, we don't trust institutions, we trust people. And so, as leaders of organizations, we need to build organizations that are full of trustworthy people. Mm -hmm. The way you become trustworthy is you look at your participation in structural oppression, um, in systematic racism, in systematic 
all the isms, right? And so, you know, Stephen Weil is always quoted about museums moving from being uh, about objects to being for people. And that was really focused on visitors. And we really need to extend that now in this moment, I think we're all seeing, to the people who work within organizations. Because unless we're for our people, we're not going to be for other people. Mm -hmm. Let's spend a little time talking about that. Um, you know, we often build values based on visitors, right? Um, I even find that interesting. It's like you're visiting my home as opposed to a user, if you will. Um, and so maybe the two of you can talk a little bit about this notion of, um, of what it takes to do that. What, is it, what does it take to actually build that kind of environment where the values are not only externally facing, but they're internally facing, and they're the same. Right. I was telling them on the phone that my, my mother is from Mississippi, um, and, I, and I just quote her all the time, for better or for worse. And there's this one, you know, she used to tell me when I was a child, you know, you know, when you're picking your friends, you know, just know that if they're ugly on the inside, they'll be ugly on the outside at one, day, one point. It's like whatever you do inside also spills outside at some point, right? And so just make those the same um, and be consistent. And so maybe we can talk about what you were just saying, Ben, this idea that those need to be aligned, right? Yeah, absolutely. Ben, do you want to go? Or? Sure. I mean, I, there's a lot of um, one of my great dear colleagues, Sheila McDaniel, who's out there in the audience somewhere, is always saying, you know, we got to walk before we can run. Mm -hmm. And there's... Um, a lot of, I think, excitement and enthusiasm around the idea of DEAI and what we can do to be more inclusive and like bring in new audiences and diversify the collection and all those things are fantastic, but we also need to treat our audience, or excuse me, our staff as our, one of our primary audiences, right? And, and not have that daylight, like you said, between how we treat people inside and how we treat people outside. And so we're doing a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm uh, leading an initiative at the, at the National Gallery called Workspace to where we're really trying to interrogate our newly articulated values as a staff, you know, and in small groups, really reach a shared understanding of what those values mean and how we're going to behave towards each other in support of those values. Because we recognize, like Ben said, we're an organization that's made up of people who, who behave and people do things and people need to know each other and have some self-awareness. And um, so really we're focusing very much on, on that as a start. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know there's a session later today on sort of human-centered HR practices, and I'm really excited to sort of hear how they get, uh, you know, that panel gets into this conversation a little bit more. But if you are, you know, we have to think about the whole lives of the people who are coming and um, existing in our space. The model for our industry for nonprofits generally has been that um, people come, they give, as much of their energy as we can extract from them, as much of their time as we can extract for them. And in exchange, they get a wage that does not meet their basic needs and very little or no security upon retirement or sort of in that last part of their life. So until we look at the salary, discrep the salary um, discrepancies in our field, we're not gonna be able to do this. We have to build this on people's Security. I mean, we think of sort of like the Maslow hierarchy. We've got to take care of those basic needs. And, you know, I was talking with the board of this new museum about this and talking, proposing a set of salaries for staff as we're going to staff up. And, you know, a reasonable perspective that can come forward is, well, let's make sure we're looking at salary surveys across our industry and across nonprofits. And I really want to push back on that. We don't need consultants to come and do salary surveys because salary surveys only show us the current situation and that current situation is not equitable. If you are a person who doesn't come from generational wealth, you need to pay your rent, you need to pay your student loan, you need, depending on where you live, you know, 500 to 750, $1,000 a month to cover your basic costs. We want you to put a little money in savings and we want you to put money in retirement. Minimum wage in New York, I don't need a survey to tell me, I can do the math. You need to make $75,000 at a minimum in New York City in order to do those five things. 
So that's where we pitched our minimum wage. And I think all of us get really nervous and sort of turn to consultants. And listen, I will hire consultants day and night. Like, I love the work that consultants do for organizations. But in this particular instance, I don't need a consultant to let me know what I see directly in front of me, you know, which is the real situation of real people who are working. And we want to diversify this field. And we want it to be a place that works for people who don't come from generational wealth. And we want people to be able to know that at the end of their life, they're going to be secure, right? Yeah. So. so um, I think this is going to be such an amazing panel that I know people want to clap every time Ben and Mika <laughs> speak. But if, if we could just stand up and like do one big cheer at the end, we'll, we'll get even more of these tidbits in. Um, this generational wealth piece really strikes a chord with me um, in that I've been at several institutions, um, um, either been privy to conversations or myself, um, been someone who is just like, oh, so we're all going to take a 10% pay cut you know, during this moment where we actually are at a certain level of the institution, those of you that are at this level or above, you're going to need to, we're all going to just, it's just like, we're all going to go glass, grab a glass of water. We're all going to take a 10% pay cut. And I was talking with my colleagues here about this, and I've said this in other forums, that while I might have been at a particular level in the organization, I also don't come from possibly the same place that the other people that share that landscape sit within. Um, and so I don't come from generational wealth. Um, I, I, I actually am probably, as the, I'm the main provider in certain spaces in my family, um, as is my husband. And so my dollars are different, say, than someone else's. So this notion of generational wealth is not a topic that we talk a lot about in institutions. And oftentimes, those conversations are reserved for particular levels of the organization. Actually, I mean, we just talked about this the other day, and we were having a conversation, and this came up. And I said, I brought up the generational wealth piece because I don't find that even in a leadership space, I, I, we have those discussions. So I think it's an important piece to talk about. I also think we should stop giving ourselves like, you know, um, carrots or not carrots, um, certificates for making whatever the basic minimum wage is, right? Um, I think it's an important thing to talk about um, how we do not do something else in order to actually make sure that our teams are taken care of. Um, and so I think, Ben, what you're doing is very courageous. Um, and I think it's a really important um, factor, and I hope that that resonates with a lot of folks um, because it's an imperative. Can so, I, yes. I just add, I think another thing that's really important is that at an organization, and especially like the bigger your organization gets, that you have got ways for people to advance, and it's not necessarily advancing just within the organization, but that they're growing, that you're giving them opportunities to grow and learn as a, as a professional and gain the skills and competencies that they need to advance their career wherever it may be, whether it's at your museum or to go somewhere else, because um, that, that sort of constant growth and, and prioritizing the development of the staff, I think, is another way that we can um, help the, people get to the point where they, where they you know, are making a salary that they can live on. Yes, and this is real. I think that we often feel like the person has to grow exponentially at our sites, and we have this false sense that the art world and the cultural world has produced that someone has to be an intern, then they become a coordinator, then they become a blah, 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 and then they, and then they become the director, and then they're on the board, and then they leave all their money to the institution. <laughs> it's kind of like that, that has happened at only, that has never happened for me. Um, <laughs> But I also think that that's happened at certain kinds of institutions that it's not even that that structure is in place, it's also that in order for that to happen, you also have spent such significant time there that you have the inside track. It's, you know what I mean? There's a different, uh, I mean, we really have to talk about this in a very different way when we're talking about staff growth. So I tell people all the time, if there's not a position that we have, I can help you find a job somewhere else. Like, that is an actual gift that we can use to activate our networks. We oftentimes don't think of things that way. 
Um, and so I think that's a really helpful thing that you're, you're, you're talking about. All right, so how about how our budgets reflect our values and morals? <laughs> So we talked a little bit about how transparency um, can also apply to how we allocate our resources. Um, what does it mean to pay? You just talked about a livable wage for workers. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, the budgeting, like mm -hmm. where dollars go, what that means, what that signals. I mean, you know, I think if we go back to Stephen Wow being um, about objects or for people, and think about where we put our money. Do we put our money in the people in our organization, or do we put them in support of the collections or the artifacts or the cultural resources that we have? Um, I think, you know, to your point, a budget is a moral document, and, um, you know, I think for big organizations, you know, it's, it's I'm excited to be the leader of this new organization, and this growing organization. I know there's many people in this room who are thinking like, well, that can work for the American LGBTQ Plus Museum because right now we're a staff of two. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> um, and we're gonna be bringing three on this year and then four more, so look out for our jobs. Um, but, um, you know, this is something that we were implementing at the Ohio History Connection as well with 250 staff. And, you just have to understand that you're not going to get there in one year, but the transparency that you use with your team is to say, we're taking this seriously, we're creating a process, we've got a goal, which is to get you an equitable situation, and we've done the analysis based on our realistic revenues and expenditures, and that is going to take us X number of years. Maybe that's three years, maybe that's four years. Now, it's not going to help anyone in the moment necessarily, but it is going to help them understand what you're doing. And so that's the transparency. I think many of us get these salary surveys and then we sit on them for months because we're so freaked out by what the sort of results of them are. Um, we need to just start, don't be scared to communicate. Just start with the communication and people will go with you. They'll understand your reality and your situation. But there's something else to think about too. Are you willing to do one or two fewer changing exhibitions a year in order to move resources from that area of your organization to your people? Um, you have to be willing to take a step back in certain places to move forward the equity. And you're not gonna do both at once and you can't tell the staff, well, we still need to be doing this and so it's gonna take 10 years to get there. That's not reasonable. So I think those are some of the decisions that we have to make in large institutions, um, you know, as well as in small. You know, um, and so we all know that, you know, there's restricted funds. You can't move these funds for this. I mean, I could see the whole slew of directors being like, you know, we can't do that. <laughs> um, and so there's, there are other ways um, to do it and keep it top of mind, right? Um, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about um, museums as sites for discourse and being in and of the world. Um, we have recent culture wars, there's Roe versus Wade, um, there's all kinds of things. Um, there's how people stood up or stood back or participated um, uh, in you know, tweets and posts and letters, et cetera. Let's talk about museums as, as places and vehicles for that kind of, for, for discourse and dialogue and the comfort levels and how that's tied to equity and that's tied to race and class. Um, so let's just, you know, talk about that. Um, I mean, I'll say again, you know, having started at my museum when I did and, and having the museum be closed for a lot of that time, um, a lot of this has been internal, right? And, and what I've been focused on is thinking about, about it internally and, and in the wake of, of events like, like what happened in, in Buffalo. Like, you know, when you want as, as leadership or as the chief diversity officer or just as a colleague to be supportive, right, of your, of your, um, of your colleagues and, and the people who, who are hurting, um, 
but finding it very hard, again, in these big structures where we don't really know each other and they don't have that trust, mm -hmm. um, that there's a great deal of discomfort uh, you know, around, around that. And also lack of skills. We talked about the skills and competencies that we need to sort of move our museums forward. And I think holding an emotional space for your colleagues is, is not something that we're all very well trained to do. Um, so again, I think it goes back to, to trust and, and, and skill building, you know, before you can even have sometimes these discourses, again, walking before you run, um, at least for, for us, we're, we're at the gallery where I feel like we, we have more work to do um, mm -hmm. around that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we are all representing institutions that exist in states where women's reproductive rights and LGBTQ people's lives are pretty guaranteed to be protected by state uh, governmental structure, at least for the foreseeable. But many of our colleagues are working in states where educators are not allowed to talk about the real um, issues that are going on, the real experiences of black and brown people, the real experiences of queer people, um, and they're not allowed to address the reproductive and health choices that women need to make. As museums, we need to be there to step up. We need to step up and be there for our colleagues who are facing those issues and um, n all of a sudden or now living in, uh, in a place that feels much more hostile to their lives than it even did you know, a few months ago. We need to be there for our, our, the educators and those in um, uh, across the state who are now trying to grapple with um, this muzzling of, of truth. Um, and those of us who are in states where that has not yet become a reality or where the state legislatures aren't trending that way need to figure out ways to support our colleagues in those, in, in those other states. But you know, even in New York, right, we had front-facing staff attacked by a visitor with a knife. We are dealing with a population nationwide that is at the edge of its sort of mental wellness and it is our front facing staff and the lowest paid people in our institutions who are feeling the brunt of that. And I hear so many leaders say, I can't wait to get the staff back to the organization. I can't wait to see people here. I hate walking through the offices and not seeing people. And it's like, yeah, but that's because mostly we, I, am hanging out in the offices and not you know, um, up front. And so we just need to recognize that the human-centered policies that came up as a result of this pandemic are the best policies ongoingly. It's just like the best accessible design is the best design for everyone. These policies where we actually realize we need to accommodate the whole lives of people due to the global pandemic are the best ones for everyone. So we really, need to pay attention and connect with our colleagues who are in these states where these laws are getting passed. And we should be talking within our institutions about how we can support their work if they're not allowed to do it. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I'm sitting here thinking about how the pandemic heightened so many things that were already in existence. Um, and, uh, I'm struggling with um, our field consistently acting like it happened in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, these things were existing for quite some time. The number of times, when in my 20s I was like confronted by museum visitors mm -hmm. who felt that I should do A, B, and C, you know. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it's not only about how do we protect staff and also protect some, some people that are coming to our institutions from some of our ill-equipped staff, mm -hmm. yeah. which I have to say is there's a preponderance of that. Yes. And so like maybe we could have a little bit of a discussion also about, you know, through HR, through DAIB. I love the belonging that's actually finally found its place in this work. Um, maybe we can have that, like, we've been nice so far in the conversation. Let's just go there. We are being recorded, Sandra. Yeah. Huh? We are being recorded. 
I know what she started. <laughs> She's serious too, I know. Um, uh, and I, I know that too, but, um, but how do we actually have the, and maybe that happens in the session after in small group work, but how do we have the conversation about the ways in which we have to build a staff that is not only competent to talk about the basics of line, form, figure, yeah. foreground, middle ground, and background, um, the history of a work of art, they can have a conversation about, you know, um, Artemisia Gentileschi, but not necessarily about Carrie James Marshall or Kara Walker. Or one can have a conversation about Fragonard, but not necessarily fill in the blank. Um, how do we have these discussions and what skills and competencies are truly necessary? Like, let's just name some of them so that we're like putting some names on some of the things that are necessary for us to actually become the institutions we've been talking about for the last two years, um, as opposed to acting like what was before was normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Because that wasn't normal. Was, how many of you feel like the before was normal? I mean, that might, maybe pieces of it were. Pieces, maybe. Um, and so let's, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what skills um, do we need to be the places that we described just now as wanting to be? I think one really important trait is, is emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being, which is closely tied to empathy, but, but like being able to, to read what another person is, is doing or feeling or sort of understanding like what's motivating them and, and how to reach them, how to, how to make your position um, legible and to them and, and also uh, humility. I think those are probably two of the, mm -hmm. of the for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would add to that courage. Um, and, you know, one of the people, one of our board members passed recently, Irva Shived, who um, was an incredible activist um, throughout her entire career for an intersectional approach to queer liberation, really understood that, the, that liberation for one group is, is predicated on liberation for, for all and was often the only woman of color in, uh, in the activist space because of um, the white supremacy of the LGBTQ plus liberation movement, which is true of all liberation movements, which is true of all, you know, all culture. So you know, the courage um, that she modeled is the courage that we all need to have as leaders. This panel, speak the truth and point to hope that encapsulates it perfectly. When our legal counsel or our board chair says, let's not put that DEI policy into our bylaws, because that language is gonna be, you know, let's just rework this for the third time. Hello, I'm looking at someone out there. Um, because like that language isn't gonna quite fly with our board. Like that's where we as leaders, we need the courage of our convictions and we need to say, yeah, you know, the legal standard is the minimal standard. Minimum wage is the minimum standard. Is that how we wanna live? Is that how we wanna be? Um, if we've learned anything in this pandemic, it's that like now that we're stepping into a different way of being, we need to make it count and we need to make it count for everyone and that's not about minimums and that's not about caution. We need to be courageous. Yeah, thank you for that. I think it's also interesting to maybe also, in, in addition to all that you all said, and I'm not being flippant when I say this, I do think the, the reading competency and comprehension and treating this work that we're talking about as a basic skill. Like it's, it's basic. I know how to check email, I know how to check this. Like I didn't learn, you all didn't learn what you're doing by osmosis. You actually are very well read people in this field that have studied and there are entire bibliographical, you know, bi there's entire bibliographies on how to do um, all of these things, emotional intelligence. You know, even if you're at the airport, there's that little roundabout bookstore, in, you know, at the airport where it's like Harvard Business Review, you know, and it's like emotional intelligence. I picked that up yesterday. Um, that was, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is there. I guess the thing that I'm trying to say is I think oftentimes when we're talking about objects, we become extremely well-read 
when we're talking about certain things, we read a ton. But when it comes to talking about some of these other areas of work, it's kind of ancillary. I love the fact that um, colleagues in education um, and in programming, particularly education and youth development people, really, really, it's a requirement of your work to do this. Yeah. It truly is. Um, um, OK, so next thing. And this was a question that was presented to us as something that we felt um, that, that was really, really important to talk about. Um, what has the pandemic work from home done to the workforce? And then the second part of that, will we be in the same room together ever again? Yes, we are. Um, but a lot of us are, are in conferences and activities, but we're not back in the office every day. And so what does that take? What does that look like? And, um, and how does that affect place-based organizations who need staff on site without further exacerbating the frontline staff and everyone else gets to work from home in their pajamas? So let's talk a little bit about that and the, the impact of the, the, that, this moment. Mika, you had a, something to share. Well, I mean, I think, um you know, I, I think that the work work from home, what, what it's, what are the, one of the things that it's done, at least for me, is like it's really underscored the need for connection and, the, the, and however that may happen, you know, and I'm old and I'm old fashioned, so I'm, you know, I don't, I don't yet know really what that looks like outside of in person, you know, everyone's in the office all the time. Um, I think we're all learning, I mean, everyone is corporations, universities, Museums, we're all we're all trying to figure this out. Um, but I, you know, I think it's trying to figure out like what is when you need to be like. There's certain functions we know need to be in the museum. You can't guard the galleries from home, mm -hmm. um, for example. Um, but for everyone else who does have portable work, you know, how do you make it? How do you make the time in the office meaningful, right? Like, what are the th kinds of things that can only happen on site? And that's going to look different for every organization and for different size organizations. And, um, you know, but balancing that with also, especially at a big organization like the National Gallery, wanting to give each team and each work group, you know, autonomy to figure out what's work what works best for them, right? It may not be that everybody should be there on Wednesday across the board. That might not be what that team needs. Um, but it's a, it's a real struggle. I mean, I, that's, that's what we're spending a lot of time talking about right now. Uh, I don't have the answer. But I think people need to connect. They still need to know each other, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, matter, no matter whether they're working from home or, or on site. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ben? Yeah, I mean, Sandra, you were talking a little bit before this session about when people ask you what the workplace culture is at the Lucas, and it's like, how do we, I mean, we don't know what the work, we know what the workplace culture on Zoom is, is you know, quoting, you know, uh, we know what the workplace culture is of these meetings we have. And I think all of us, whether we're a new organization starting up um, or whether we're an established organization that has had two and a half, two years of, um, uh, you know, our, uh, inter our interactions very deeply affected by, by what we're all going through, um, we really are, in this incredible moment, this is a point to hope moment where we get to decide what we want that workplace culture to be. We get to sort of together maybe co-create that with our staffs and then you know, look for ideas and ways that we can build toward that where people are working in all different ways, right? I mean, I'm so proud of my colleagues at the Ohio History Connection during the pandemic when we made the decision to resource childcare um, significantly for staff because all of us saw the pressures on parents during the pandemic. And like you said, those pressures on parents were different during the pandemic, but they existed before and they had just as much need of that support before as they do now. Um, so we figured out some good things together during this pandemic. And so let's make this the topic, right? And figure this out together because uh, our, our team knows what they want the culture to be. So we just, we get to listen and lead that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, can we talk also about how we position these values, right? And so, um, we know that oftentimes um, values are not, um, <laughs> they're not resourced, they just are. 
Have you guys ever felt that? It's like there's the mission, vision, values, and then there's tactics for those of us that are working on strategic plans, et cetera. Um, and tactics and things like that are resourced. But values oftentimes don't get resourced. They just kind of are. They're like osmosis stuff. You know, it's just in the air. Kind of like over the years, diversity, equity, inclusion, all that stuff is just kind of in the air. You just learn it. You just get it, right? And so um, maybe we can talk a little bit about like the intentionality around um, resourcing values. Because that's what we've been talking about here, yeah. right? The deficit around resourcing values. Yeah. So how do we get there? What kind of messaging do we need to share to get there? I think uh, one, I think foundationally, having a shared understanding of what the values mean, right? Because they are very, um, like for, for example, the National Gallery, you know, you've got um, empathy, uh, you've got uh, excellence, for example, which can be a very loaded term, right? Um, so reaching a, an institutional sort of shared understanding about what we, what we mean by those things, because I think without that, you know, you've got different people who have different perceptions. You've got, you've got um, the potential for, for them to be weaponized against different groups if you, you know, if you don't agree with my definition of empathy, for example. So getting to a shared, shared understanding of that and what, how you're gonna behave, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to um, further that value. And then, you know, I think the way you weave it through is like when you look at the tactics and what are the things you're going to do, and those are the things that get resourced, you choose them based on how well they demonstrate the shared understanding of the values, right? Like the, you should not, you should be looking at every project or every, every priority to see like how, how well is this, you know, advancing the vision, the mission, but how, where, where are the values gonna be demonstrated mm -hmm, in that mm -hmm, project? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I think what you're pointing to, uh, Sandra, is the way in which values feel like they're applied to, they're, they're so surface and they're about sort of an outward articulation and they're not deeply authentic. And I think, you know, they make our board members feel good and they make some of the team feel good, but you know, I'll, Everyone who works in an organization, you know, the, the value statements, they just annoy us if they're not backed up by, by what we're seeing happen in the workplace, right? And that is gonna be projected out, and that's the same with our communities. And so unless we start internally, to your initial point, and take care of the real whole people within our space, um, people outside of our space are not gonna feel like we actually are invested in them. Um, it is every institution has the ability to prioritize their values through their budget. Um, Michael Parson, my former boss, you know, was the one, first person who sort of articulated to me that idea that if it doesn't have a line item, it's not a priority. So where's your line item for your values? Maybe redo your budget and have those be the categories and those be the lines along with the other lines. Yeah, so that, that's really what I'm getting at. Like, how do you resource empathy? Mm -hmm. I'm pausing for emphasis there. Did you feel that? <laughs> yeah, how do, you, how do you, even excellence, you know? How do you resource these things? Um, does it mean certain kinds of trainings? Does it mean access to certain kinds of people? Does it mean mentorship? Does it, what does it mean? Because when we think about coaching, oftentimes it's like, the person with the problem gets the coach. Mm. Yeah. You know, not, 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 it's just, you should have coaching at your disposal. Yeah. Oh, you wanna, you know, go to this training, but coaching is different, right? And so how do we actually start to think with a different type of intentionality? I love the idea of like this idea of <laughs> empathy as a line item. I'd love to see how board members <laughs> respond to that. <laughs> um, yeah, and there could also be like, you know, as a part of professional development for the board, you know, like empathy, um, excellence, yeah. you know, all these kinds of things as well. All right. Um, well, Sandra, I think what you had said before about the kinds of groundings and education that we expect for our team members when they come into organizations and the things that we don't look for. So, you know, you sort of started that idea. It's like they'll know a lot about their 
the field, history, science, you know, child development, whatever it might be, um, you know, we, if we're not requiring people to have done anti-racist training or decolonizing training, we at least need to provide that. We need to make sure that they know that that's equally important um, in terms of their development if they want to work in this organization. Absolutely. And that's something that we can help them do because we know our educational systems aren't currently structured to provide that, right? Exactly. Yeah, and I think and also being, in, being intentional about, about hiring for, for those skills, for skills around, you know, that would make someone able to develop staff yeah. and, 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 and sort of ripple that out um, and being more intentional about those, the qualities that we're looking for when we're, in addition to the expertise and the, and the experience, um, mm -hmm. but the, the sort of, again, back to that emotional intelligence um, and that, uh, that growth mindset that you want to see in, in, in everyone you're bringing into your organization and certainly the people you're hiring or promoting into management positions. Mm -hmm. I live for the day where we um, treat these things we're talking about as the skill and competency and a part of the job expertise. Yeah. I don't know why we don't, it's like, you know, wow, you treat people poorly. Um, but you're excellent at writing. Yeah. <laughs> like, what is that? Like, you know what I mean? A lawsuit, maybe? You know, I don't really understand that, right? Like, how do you actually, we live in a world where this is where we are. Mm -hmm. And so to treat people poorly in the workplace is to actually create a vulnerable organization yeah. if you're the person that really only thinks about the institution. Um, and so it's a very interesting proposition to think differently about what it means to form a job. What does it mean to actually look at um, uh, that? Um, okay, uh, I think the last question, the timer's not on to tell me when to stop, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, but the last question I have um, is, uh, what is the most urgent thing you think we can be talking about when it comes to speaking the truth and pointing to hope in the workplace? or at cultural institutions, doesn't even have to just be in the workplace, our presence in the world. I, I, I mean, I think it's been said already, but it's, it's the human centeredness. It's the, it's the um, you know, even for an art museum or a collecting organization, the, you have the collections for a reason. They're, they're a tool uh, to serve people. I, so I think this really uh, relentless focus on, on, on human centering everything that we do everything that we do be so human-centered, okay? Yeah. I mean, I do think that there's so much urgency when we look at what's going on um, in culture, in society, in our organizations, um, but I do think that is a full circle question, right, where the, it goes back to tr what Mika was talking about with trust. So start by how do you build trust within, we know how to build trust in systems, right? Privacy makes sense. Secrets are bad for systems, right? We have to get rid of secrets and talk about why certain things are private, right? And we have to have a conversation about whether that makes sense to people. Um, people, we just need to build trust within our groups that we, you know, a lot of our institutions made decisions to lay off lots of people during the pandemic. And those who were laid off went to other institutions maybe and feel the real trauma of that and those who remained feel the uncertainty and the trauma of being the, the people who, who stayed behind. There's, that was a process that was done very quickly in many institutions, not in thoughtful conversation, not with us being really explicit about our process for making those decisions. We have had this enormous breach of trust within our, within our museum families, our workplace families, so we have to start by rebuilding that being humble, as Mika said, acknowledging that in some instances we, we messed that up and um, this is what was happening and this is what we commit to moving forward. So, um, yeah. Yeah, this notion of trust is a deep one and we can, I think, end on that. This, Mika, you said the trust deficit is at the center of the difficult things we are trying to deal with when we're on the phone. It's a great quote, mm -hmm. um, the trust deficit. Um, I find um, it to be an important bit of conversation, particularly because it's not just about the folks that 
are working in our institutions. Um, just the infrastructure, the history of museums that as, a, as a structure, um, the history of cultural organizations as entities are wrapped in this notion of distrust for certain kinds of folks. You know, we're on display. There's a, there's a whole history, you know, colonialism, you know, pillaging and pulling and all those kinds of things. Um, and so I think it's an interesting opportunity for us to think about how trust actually is one of the greatest currencies we need to analyze. Um, because without it, on some level, um, uh, it's, it's not even that people have to trust you. They, they just kind of need to like you a little bit, you know? Um, uh, a lot of our research that, we've, that I feel like I've participated in across um, institutions has been around like, how do you feel when you come to this institution? Or why don't you come to this place? Or what, what did you like and didn't like? Um, and oftentimes, pages and pages and pages of research gets narrowed down or boiled down to they didn't feel welcome. They didn't feel welcome. And the reality is that a lot of people, I mean, people care about being welcome, but a lot of, I don't feel welcome at certain stores I go to, you know? I feel, I don't feel welcome. However, I go there because I want the thing that I want to get, those shoes, that bag, that sandwich, that whatever. And so I take the risk of feeling not welcome. The reality is that um, oftentimes people don't, people don't choose us or they don't trust us because they just don't like us. They don't like how we're behaving in the world. And so I think what you were talking about is um, from a trust point of view is super central to how we need to think about unpacking it moving forward so that we humanize our places. Um, the, the words that we're using to describe institutions are very, um, personal and human, um, and so I think at the center of this is this notion of if we're going to point the if we're going to speak the truth and point to hope, we need people to at least like us a little bit. <laughs> um, imagine being in some kind of relationship with us, seek love with us, um, and dare I say, love, love, love. So I want to say thank you all for joining me for this conversation. Yeah.